If you would open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we begin with a question. How is it that the following things can happen? How is it that a prayer led in the Congress of the United States is a pagan prayer and it closes out with a men and a women? How is it that the House of Representatives directs its members to use gender-neutral terms? In other words, they're not supposed to use he and him, she and her. How is it that writing, rioting, and looting and violence are tolerated in many different cities over a period of months. How could that happen in our society or really any society? And the answer to that is that the salt has lost or is losing its savor or its flavor. It's a lack of individual men and women who are dedicated to the Lord to living by his principles and upholding those principles. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. When you think about that idea of the salt losing its savor, that there are not enough people committed to upholding principles of truth and righteousness, you can look back and see the impact that it's had on nations, on societies in history. One of the key reasons that the Roman Empire fell apart was this breakdown of morality and righteousness and justice. If we look at Europe today, we see that there is a moral vacuum. That they are living in a secular humanist society. They are much further down the road than what we are in going into what we might say all-out paganism. The United States is steadily declining. Righteousness is fading. Morality is relative, just what you think or what I think or what any groups thinks. It changes from one situation to another. And that, by the way, is why riots, looting, violence, fires, burning, destruction, occupation of cities can go on for months on end. And that's endorsed. And then just a few months later, there's a riot that lasts about an hour and it's roundly condemned. Not saying that either one of them should be approved of. But why is it that there is such a stark contrast in the view in those things? Reason is because morality is relative. Because the salt has lost its savor. Now we as people claiming to have allegiance to the Lord, we need to see it as our duty that we are the salt of the earth. As Jesus states here, that you are the salt of the earth. And as being the salt of the earth, we should not lose our flavor. We should not be diluted. But that we should fulfill our duty and our responsibility in this world to help it out. Now, I want to do something just a little bit different here. In this first point, I want to go through the usefulness of salt, the physical, actual element of salt. Now, I want us to think about this and then have that in the back of your mind as we think about us being salt. The physical element of salt is a preservative, 
Uh, it's especially a great preservative for meat. It draws water out and ties up water within, making it unavailable for chemical reactions that cause decay. So it pulls the water out and those elements that would tend to decay the meat, they can't act because the salt has pulled the water out. <coughs> High concentrations of salt interfere with the replication of microorganisms such as bacteria. Now, chemicalsafetyfacts.com says that sodium chloride is essential to the body. And other references talk about how salt helps nutrients to be absorbed into the body, how it helps to send messages along the nervous system to convey those and it helps to balance the amount of water in the body so if you have too much you can be dehydrated if you have too little you can have too much water if I understand all of that correctly not a scientist but just looking these things up now one of the things about salt that perhaps you don't know is that in ancient times it was used as currency Roman soldiers sometimes would be paid in salt. That's how valuable it was. In fact, our word for salary is based on salt. Salarium argentum is what it was called when the Roman soldiers were paid. So you think about the great value of salt and how humanity has recognized it for centuries. Well, then spiritually, you think about salt that it's useful and therefore valuable. If we are faithful to God, we act as salt in this world. And that's why Jesus is using that language here, you're the salt of the earth, because he recognized, and people commonly recognize, there's something very good about salt. Something very valuable and useful and helpful in this world. So he says to the children of God, you're the salt of the earth. Salt, if you will, us, we're essential to spiritual life. We are essential to propagating the gospel. Just as salt in the body helps to deliver the messages along the nerves, as children of God acting as salt in the world, we help deliver that message of God into the world around us. And we act as a preservative. We help to hinder the growth of bacteria, if you will, spiritual bacteria. We help to stop that. We restrict the spread of sin. Now I want us to think for a moment about how Christians act as a preservative and think back to a couple of Old Testament examples of where individuals acted as salt. If you go back to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. And you remember at the beginning of the chapter there that when Moses was up on the mountain the children of Israel made an idol in the form of a calf and they began to bow down and to worship it. And in Exodus chapter 32, the Lord reveals to Moses that he's angry with the children of Israel for falling into that idolatry and had decided that he wanted to wipe them off the face of the earth and raise up a nation from Moses. But in Exodus 32, verse 11, it says that Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say, He brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. See, that's an example of a child of God acting as salt. He helped to preserve the nation of Israel here and he did that through appealing to God, a prayer, a plea with God that he would spare them. And he bases that on the idea of how that would look that he brought them out of the land of Egypt just to destroy them immediately in the desert. What would people say about that? 
So he helped preserve this nation. He was acting as salt. Another example, and we won't read out of the book, but the book of Acts deals with another who was in a position of influence and power that as there was a decree that went out that all the Jews would be destroyed, they would be attacked, and Esther finds out about that and she goes and she appeals to the king that there would be something done so that the Jews would not be destroyed. So she exercised her influence with someone in a position of power. She acted as salt again to preserve the people of God. The opposite end of this is Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember when God revealed to Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities around them. And Abraham appealed to him and he got him to go from 50 down to 10. Look, if there are 10 righteous people, will you spare them? Yes, God said, I will spare them. There were not 10 righteous people. There was not enough salt in Sodom and Gomorrah to spare them from God's destruction. So we act as a preserving influence in this world in part through our ability to appeal to God, to seek God's mercy, to seek God's favor, to seek His patience and His long-suffering. And we realize that at times in the past that has not happened. And we live in a nation where it seems that that salt is losing its savor. It's losing its preservative effect. If we go back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We want to look at the context in which Jesus talked about being the salt of the earth. We commonly call these, Matthew 5, verses 3 and following, the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, beginning then. Blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. It says, first of all, that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That idea of being poor in spirit is a recognition of your destitute condition before God. That spiritually you are bankrupt. And you recognize the need for the riches that are in Christ. That you need those blessings from Him. You need that forgiveness from Him. Because without Him, you have nothing. And he says that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As we go down through these, we recognize that when he talks about this blessing associated with each character, disposition, or attitude... These are parallel things that he, he's describing the same thing with different terminology. And what he's saying is you're going to have eternal life. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You'll be given salvation because you have a recognition of that and you humble yourself before God. In Matthew 5 verse 4 it says, Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. You mourn over sin. Over sin in your life over sin in the life of others around you. Because you recognize sin is an offense to God, to my Creator, to the One who has given me life, to the One who has blessed me with all things in this life that sustain me in life, the One who gives me all things that are good. I've sinned against Him. I've offended a holy God, and that should sadden us. That should cause us to mourn in our hearts and souls. And if we have that type of attitude, that disposition, it says that we will be comforted. We are comforted when we are pardoned for our sin. When we come to the Lord, we submit to His will, we're forgiven. So we have a comfort, a relief, because we've been pardoned. And we have a comfort because we know there is somewhere we are going that is better. 
a land of peace and of rest. He says, blessed are the meek. The idea of meek is, in this context, you humble yourself before God. You have the power, you have the ability to make decisions in life that you can go and do what you want to do. You can go and participate in sin. And there's nothing really that's going to stop you from doing that. But you're meek and you bring yourself under the power of God's will instead of acting on your own will. So he says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land or inherit the earth. That goes back to the Old Testament promise where he's talking about that they would have the promised land. And Jesus brings it into the New Testament. Not that he's talking about that Christians are going to inherit a physical place. He's using it as a metaphor to talk about the idea of the promised land of heaven. We're going to inherit that, but we have to be meek. He says in verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's the idea that we have a deep and abiding appetite for truth. We want the truth. We pursue it. We crave it. And so we want to know what is right before God. We want to seek His righteousness. His righteousness as is revealed in His Word. We hunger and thirst for that. He says you're going to be filled. You're going to find it. It's the same concept Jesus talks about later. Ask, seek, knock. You're going to get the answer. That door is going to be open. You're going to find the truth. You hunger and thirst for righteousness, you're going to be filled. You're going to find that now. And when you are in heaven, you're going to be filled forever. There will be no lack, no wanting there. In verse 7, blessed are the merciful. We have to be compassionate willing to forgive others. We have to have an appreciation that our own soul has received mercy from God and have a desire that others would receive mercy from God. Because he says, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. If we don't extend mercy, mercy will not be extended to us. So we extend mercy. We pursue that. And we will receive it as well. Verse 8, he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart is the idea that we're wise concerning what is good and we're simple concerning what is evil. We don't have those corrupt desires. We have a heart that's being cleansed with truth, as Jesus talked about in John 15, verse 3, that they have been cleansed through the truth. The apostles had been. We are cleansed through that truth. He says, you shall see God. The idea of us dwelling with Him in heaven forever and ever. Being in His presence. Worshiping Him and praising Him through all eternity. Verse 9, He says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Those who seek to bring peace between God and man are peacemakers. That's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about this peace among the nations or anything like that. He's talking about this peace that is needed far and above all other things. Peace between God and man. Because when we are in sin, we're the enemies of God. But when we submit to God and do His will, our sins are forgiven. We're friends of God. We're in fellowship with God. We're no longer His enemies. And so we are peacemakers seeking to help others to be at peace with the Lord. And he says you will be called sons of God. That is the idea counted as members of the family of God and therefore heirs of the blessings that God has. That inheritance that is in heaven. If we are peacemakers, that's what we have ahead of us. Then he says, verses 10 through 12, that we're blessed and persecuted for righteousness sake. Faithful service to God brings a backlash from the world around us. It will cause others to be angry, to attack us, to try to destroy us, to try to discourage us from serving the Lord. But we know that the Lord tells us that we're blessed and we actually need to count persecution as a joy and rejoice 
that were able to partake in the sufferings of Christ. To do as the apostles did in Acts chapter 5, when they were brought before the council and they were told not to preach at all or teach in the name of Jesus, at the end of Acts 5 it says they were beaten and then they went on their way rejoicing. We who would love God, who would serve Him, need to recognize when we do that, we're going to face opposition in this world. But He says, you know what? Verse 10, For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's a time coming when we'll be able to lay down our arms, as it were, and we'll be able to be at rest and at peace. We won't be in this conflict anymore. We won't be attacked constantly. But we'll be at peace and at rest in heaven. So the Lord gives us all these things in the Beatitudes, and then He follows that up again in verse 13. You're the salt of the earth. How are we the salt? We're the salt when we put these things into action in our life. Christians act as a preservative through daily living. We act as a preservative in our society in part, in part, through voting, letting our voice be known, that we would try to support people who uphold principles of justice and righteousness. We have our influence here. We're blessed to live in a nation where we have a voice and despite what has happened, won't get on a tangent there, but we have a voice. And we can act in that way. Another way we act as a preservative in our society is simply by being here, attending church services. Have you ever noticed you get up on Sunday morning and you're about the only one on your street in your neighborhood that's up and going? Over time, you kind of observe and see, you know, we're us and people three doors down or whatever, we're the only ones out on Sunday. Well, when we get up, we go to church services on Sunday, we get out and we're gone on Wednesday, people know that, neighbors know that, friends know that, co-workers sometimes know that. Well, that is acting as a preservative influence. That there are other people who recognize and see there are people that are dedicated to God, who love the Lord, who make that a priority in their life. That's sending a message into the world around us. We send a message into the world around us, of course, when we teach as well. When we're speaking the Word of God, when we're teaching others, when we're sitting down and having studies, or we have conversations and we bring up biblical principles and ideas and passages to talk to people about these things. When we say a prayer in public, we go to restaurants, even now we still can go to some at least. You know when you bow your head to pray before a meal, other people recognize that. I know I've had several people. In fact, I had a pilot one time in an airport come up to me and pat me on the back and thank me that I had prayed over my, I think it was an egg biscuit. But he thanked me for that. Why did he do that? Because it's rare to see. But that type of action, when we take it, is like salt in our society, to preserve it, to help communicate to people. There are people who believe in God, who serve God, who love God. We can be a preserving influence at work. We can speak up for what is right. And sometimes, speaking up for what is right has consequences. I understand that. There are times when we use judgment. But you know, whatever sacrifice you have to make for what's right is good. And God takes note of that. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. We act as a preserving influence at work, on the job, when we ask for time off so we can be at services. I've known of Christians who have taken their one week out of three, four, five, six, how many ever they have, they take a week during the gospel meeting so they can be there for every service. 
so that work's not interfering with that. Or asking off or making sure and arranging you get off work on time so you can be at services on time. That sends a message to everyone else. This is a priority in my life. And they take note of that. And there are times when they'll begrudge that, when they'll get upset about it, when they will be unhappy with you. But there are times where people will respect you for it, especially over time as you prove your character. They'll see that and they'll respect you for it. And that can open doors for them to ask questions on biblical matters and you have an opportunity to teach them. We can act as a preserving influence in school for those young people who are in school or around others your age. You don't participate in sinful behavior. You use assignments to uphold the truth. Maybe you're given an assignment to give a speech and you pick something out of the Bible to talk about and you reference those Bible passages. You can help uphold the truth in that way. You don't get involved with the foul language, telling of the dirty jokes, participating in gossip or lewd talk. And you conduct yourself in word, your speech, your behavior, the way you dress in a godly manner. That you convey to others, I live by a different standard. That acts as a preserving influence. It's one particular that I want to take note of in 1 Peter chapter 3. That we can act as a preserving influence within our family. Remember 1 Peter 3 verse 1, Wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. There is a wife here who's living in a home that the husband is an unbeliever. In this context, in the first century, he's probably an idolater. But because of her faithfulness to God and her example and her influence, it can lead to a door being opened that he would obey the gospel. She's acting as salt here. So we can act as salt in our own home. We can serve God even if nobody else in our home is serving God. What happens if the salt loses its savor? And how does that happen? If you are salt, how do you end up losing it? Well, if we go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. We want to read verses 18 to 22 and we'll see exactly how the salt loses its flavor. For we speak great swelling words of emptiness, or they speak great swelling words of emptiness. They allure through the flesh, or through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed her wallowing in the mire. You see, Peter's talking about those who obeyed the gospel. They came out of the world. They were purified and they were acting as salt of the earth. But then they went back into the world. They became entangled in the sin and the unrighteousness again. And that's how it happens when the salt is mixed with impurities. Just like if you took your table salt and you dumped in a bucket of dirt. It would corrupt it. It would not be any good anymore. Sometimes it happens all at once. Sometimes it's gradually over time. We lose our effectiveness, therefore, when we live in sin. Like the man at Corinth who had his father's wife, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He lost his influence. When Paul addresses that church there about having that man in 
the congregation is a part of the church there, he pointed out, look, this man is committing a sin that the Gentiles condemn. So that ruined that preserving influence. It ruined that quality that should have been there to help convey the truth to the world around them. We lose our flavor, if you will, when we uphold sin. When we envy sinners, as Proverbs chapter 24 talks about, when we're longing to be like the world around us, we lose our flavor, if you will. In Proverbs chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, the wise man says this, Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, for their heart devises violence, and their lips talk of troublemaking. We should not envy the sinners of the world around us because that will lead us down that path of unrighteousness and get us involved in sin. And let's understand that we don't have to be involved in sin to lose our flavor. We don't have to be committing that sin to lose our flavor. Let me give you an example. In Acts chapter 7, when Stephen was being stoned, the Bible tells us that one of the men who was there on that occasion was Saul of Tarsus. And it says, And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Over in Acts chapter 22, verse 20, Saul, who is now the Apostle Paul, says that he was consenting to the death of Stephen. He wasn't throwing the stones, but he consented to his death. So, it would be like this. We don't drink. We don't partake in intoxicants and alcohol and drugs, things like that, but we defend it. We don't gamble, but we excuse it. We don't curse, but we watch TV and movies that are filled with it. We lose our flavor, even if we're not participating in sin, by condoning it, defending it, excusing it. We lose our flavor when we oppose the truth. Remember in 3 John, 3 John verses 9 through 11, it says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And do not, and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. See, Diotrephes refused to allow faithful Christians to be a part of that church. He loved to have the preeminence. He controlled things. He was the dictator. He was the bully in this congregation. And so when we oppose the truth, we oppose what is right, we lose our flavor. We go against being a preservative to being a corrupting agent among the people of God. When we offer apologies for the truth, when we have criticism of the truth, we lose our flavor. We apologize for teaching on the one true church, for instance. Or we criticize a lesson where sin is specifically defined and application is made. We lose our flavor. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. And notice what the result of salt losing its flavor is. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So 
The impact on us, if we are the salt of the earth, and we lose our flavor, we lose that preserving influence in our life because we've allowed sin into our life, it says that we are good for nothing. It means we've lost our salvation. It means we are doomed. When we lose our salt, it affects our family. It affects the church. It affects society around us. We cause discouragement and confusion over what really is true. We breed spiritual weakness. We open the door for Satan for further attacks. And we become a part of the problem that contributes to the decay and the rot of society because we have lost our flavor. We have fallen over into the side of supporting evil instead of opposing it. If you will, open to number 842. Eight forty two. If there is any hope for our nation, then it rests in the lives of men and women who are dedicated to the Lord. The hope for our nation is not in business and economics, it's not in politicians. It's not in organizations or groups that are out there fighting for one cause or another. The hope for our nation, for our society, for any nation, any society, anywhere, depends on those who would commit themselves to the Lord. Our nation depends on you and me and others like us throughout this land and the degree to which we act as the salt of the earth. And so examine yourself this morning as I examine myself. Are you the salt of the earth? Are you acting as a preserving influence in the society around us? Are we an influence for good? Or are we contributing to the evil? Have you lost your flavor? If you've lost it, you need to repent and come back to the Lord this morning. Come back and do His will. Come back and serve Him again. Come back to the cause of good and right and help preserve those who are around you, in your family, in society. And first and foremost, save your soul. If you're one who's never obeyed the gospel, won't you come and serve the Lord? Confess that Jesus is the Christ. Repent of your sins. Turn away from them. Be baptized to have your sins washed away. And you will be salt of the earth. And you will be rewarded in the end with a home in heaven. So if you need to respond, we invite you to do it now while we stand and sing.